Thanks everyone for coming along. So for those who don't know me, I'm starting to learn, meet more and more people, which is good. Um, I'm Craig White. I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Science. And so what we're doing today, it's a little bit different to what we did last year. So as with all of these sort of workshoppy things we run, it's very useful to get any feedback that you can offer so that we can try and make these work better and better as we go on. So what my hope here is over the next few hours is to basically impart any advice that I can about writing a DECRA proposal. And when we did this last year, we got some feedback that we spent a bit too much time on the details that folk can get from the ARC website. Um, and so this year I've tried to separate it out into two sections. So the first section is gonna focus pretty heavily on the advice that you can get from the ARC website for folk who aren't um, too familiar with all of the details to try and make sure that everyone's up to speed. And you'll see, I just use a lot of, I'm just gonna repeat a lot of the text that comes directly from the site. And that's partly just because whenever I have to go and understand these things, I need to go and read all of that text. It's really important year on year to actually understand all of the details. They shift continuously. Um, one of the things you'll find as you go through this process of writing a DECRA is that the number of people you get advice from is going to be equal to the number of different bits of advice that you get. Part of that's because no one actually knows what the magic bullet is. Um, and part of it's because the scheme continually changes in subtle ways. And so people might bring um, advice from different years to you. They might bring perspectives from someone that they know for things uh, where things worked out well. Um, and so you'll get a really diverse array of stuff. So we're gonna start across this first hour or so um, with really just going into the detail of what the scheme's about, putting it in the context of the National Competitive Grant Scheme so that you understand not only how the DECRA system works, but how the entire assessment process within which the DECRA scheme sits actually works. And that's really useful, I think, because it's gonna frame how you put together your application. So I think it is worth going through all of this detail and then we'll get onto some advice, um, a little bit more sort of strategic advice after the coffee break. Now I understand that pretty much everyone signed up to both sessions, which I guess means that either both sessions are useful or I didn't explain well enough what the two sessions are about. So if that's the case, please let me know and we will keep improving year on year. So this first session is gonna cover what the ARC grant system is. It's gonna talk about the timelines for Monash um, and the ARC. Those are similar initially to what they've been in the past and then they're gonna change next year. So that complicates things a little bit. We'll talk about the process of how these grants are selected. That's changed again from last year. Um, how they get reviewed, the rejoinder process, um, what goes into making a DECRA application, and then there'll be a, I'll put a Q&A slide up afterwards. But this is gonna be quite directional in that I'll be talking a lot, but do feel free to interrupt and ask any questions. And I usually roam around, but I'm gonna try and stay here so that I'm always in camera for those who are watching um, at home. In the second session, we're gonna have perspectives from two College of Experts members. So these are people who carry a lot of weight in the decision-making process. They actually overlap quite a bit but their advice and the advice that I would usually give folk is already a little bit out of date because the way that they put the form together has changed this year compared to previous years. So that's a problem that we're all gonna have to face and no one's gonna have an answer to because we haven't been through it yet. And then all the various bits and bobs that go into putting it together, including where you need to make some strategic decisions, which will then tie back to how the whole process works. So a lot of these are also just for me to remember all of the details. So the national so does anyone have any questions at this point about things that you wanna make sure that I cover or anything like that? All right, jump in if you do. So the National Competitive Grants Program run by the ARC is split into two components. There's a discovery component and a linkage component. The linkage component's about $286 million a year. That covers things like um, centers of excellence, it covers linkage projects that combine with industry, linkage infrastructure, equipment and facilities grants that involve universities buying big bits of kit um, in collaboration with the ARC. And all of that scheme sits sort of outside of what you're currently thinking about. What you're thinking about, the DECRA scheme, sits within the discovery part of the ARC program. So the discovery part of the program is effectively your blue skies, your basic, your fundamental research. So that includes the discovery program itself, which is grants that can fund research projects. They can fund salaries, but anyone who's named on the grant can't receive a salary from it. So that provides some complications for folk who need to write grants to secure their salary. That scheme also includes the fellowships. At the top end of the scale is the laureate fellowships for very senior um, professor types. 
then you have the um, future fellowships for mid-career, and then you have the DECRA fellowships for early career. So the DECRA fellowships are, I think I've got that next slide. So the DECRA scheme is one element of the discovery program. So the DECRA scheme, and this is where the language starts to become important, which is why I'm going to keep having all these detail up. So it provides focused research support for early career researchers in both teaching and research and research only positions. So every year that these DECRAs are announced, there are always complaints on Twitter that associate professors are getting DECRAs. The scheme itself is very specific that teaching and research staff are eligible to apply. It doesn't exclude those people. So part of the challenge that each of you have as you go about thinking about putting one of these together is you're currently in the, the point of your careers where you need to worry about the way the system actually works. You can worry about making it better at some other point. So there's gonna be a lot of frustrations through this scheme. It's gonna be a lot of things that you think are not appropriate and are not done correctly. They're often sort of trying to optimize a complicated problem. But my first suggestion to everyone is put all those complaints aside. Just worry about what the rules are, worry about how you can optimize your chances within the rules. And then when you get to later points of your career, you can try and change it if you need to. Um, energy worrying about who's in the pool and who should apply um, is just gonna be frustrating and it's not gonna get you to where you need to be. So to be eligible, you need to have an award of a PhD date, which is in accordance with the eligibility dates. So it's within the last five years. So from 1st March, 2015, um, accounting for allowable periods of career interruption. So there is an opportunity to put forward career interruptions. These extend, certain types of, of career interruptions will extend your eligibility, um, but you're basically in a pool with people who've had up to five years of experience post PhD. They say that it's anticipated that up to 200 Discovery Early Career Researchers Awards will be provided each year and pretty much every year except the first year of the scheme when there were more, there have been 200 awards. So the number of awards that are provided is basically dictated, or the success rates basically dictated by the number of people who apply and that's been pretty stable um, through time. So you're in a pool of people up to five years PhD, post PhD, um, who may or may not have teaching and research positions at the top end of that. They may or may not be um, already leading research groups. There's an opportunity to account for career interruptions. And whenever the ARC assesses these things or whenever assessors take care of these things, they all always are supposed to consider relative to opportunity. So that relative to opportunity part comes in as we continue to go through the details. So the objectives of the scheme are to support basic and applied research by early career researchers, national and international research collaboration, enhance the scale and focus of research in Australian government priority areas, advance promising early career researchers, promote diverse career pathways, and enable research and research training in high quality and supportive environments. So this has again tweaked a little bit from last year. And this starts to give you where you need to, so going through all of these, you need to be thinking about how it is that you put your research forward that allows you to satisfy as much of this as you can. So basic and applied research is all in there. National and international research collaboration is in there. So these are individual awards, but they'll expect you to be in a, a mentoring environment. They might allow you to forge collaborations with others, to travel, um, to do things like that. Enhance the scale and focus of research in Australian government priority areas. So it's not particularly well defined what those government priority areas are, but we know what our current government is. And so if you're in parts of the um, research spectrum that support that, that works out well. Um, otherwise, you want to find evidence wherever you can that this supports research, science or um, other priorities of the government. That will become important when we think about who actually makes the decision about what grants get funded. Again, diverse career pathways, they do accommodate career interruptions and things like that and enable research and research training in high quality and supportive environments. So that's a bit of a two way street. So it enables you to be trained in a high quality research environment. It also enables research training to take place in a high quality research environment. So that could be you supervising PhD students, including things like that. So part of what the positive outcomes that can come from these schemes is not just you being supported, it's also the support that you can provide to others through being awarded this. So that's an outcome that the government cares about in terms of what they get when they support the um, DECRA scheme. We're already pretty much up against the first of the series of dates that this scheme run, runs under. So career interruption forms are due to MRO tomorrow. Did anyone know that? 
Yep, people did know that. Excellent. It's always difficult to know if the information is getting out appropriately. Um, so if you've been awarded a PhD before 1st of March, so you're outside of the clear eligibility window, there's a form to fill in, make sure that your um, career interruptions are appropriately recognised. Yep. Um, if you sign within the five years, yep. I have had about nine months of career interruption. Yep. Um, it's not important for this round, it's yep. really just the next round it could be. Mm -hmm. Should I put in a form? It's probably not going to hurt. You shouldn't need to. Um, so the career interruptions extend your eligibility. They don't affect the, as I understand the way the assessment takes place, they are dealing with only whether or not you're eligible to apply. Your outputs relative to opportunity are dealt with within the funding application itself. So if you're in the eligibility window, you shouldn't need one for this time, um, and you should have another opportunity for the next round, which will not be that long away. Yeah. No, you shouldn't need one, and then your that nine month should will be taken care of in the... Um, opportunity section. The stage that follows that is, so the stage that comes up first on February 2nd um, is where a strategic statement needs to be provided to the uh, Monash Research Office. So the strategic statement or the statement by the administering organisation is basically a document where the university says that your research is important, you're great and everything is wonderful. That document is nominally prepared by Rebecca Brown, the Senior Vice Provost and Vice Provost for Research. Obviously, she's not going to be writing letters about everyone's research because she's not going to know what everyone's research is. So the process for these starts with each of you preparing a draft, then goes to probably whoever your host will be here. Um, it then has to go through the school, and then it comes to me as Associate Dean Research, and then it goes off to the Monash Research Office. So there'll be a process that leads up to this February 2nd date when it needs to go from the faculty to the Monash Research Office. So that's one of the first things to lock away um, so that you can just have that process underway. There'll be a lot of bouncing around and we'll talk about that after. The stage that follows or comes close to that is the request not to assess form. Now requests not to assess are important. Um, so the request not, not to assess basically gives you the opportunity without any questions asked to exclude three people from reviewing your application. Now, people at the, uh, the organisation that you're applying to and previous supervisors and things will automatically be excluded. But if there are people in your field that you're concerned with regarding whether or not you're competitive, uh, competitive with them for particular ideas, if there's someone who's ragged on your PhD in the past, um, you get three freebies, they're there, you may as well use them. Um, the ARC will say they prefer that you don't use them because it reduces the pool of reviewers. But if you've got any concerns, you get three Phoebes, just take them. You could exclude anyone who's not a member of the College of Experts without explanation. If you're trying to exclude a, co exclude a College of Experts member, you need to have a, a justification for that. After that is a series of um, review steps. So there'll be a deadline for review by the Monash Research Office. Having it Available in time for the Monash Research Office to uh, renew, review it is important um, because they'll be able to check out whether there's eligibility issues, they'll be able to check out whether there's compliance issues, whether your margins are in the right spot. Um, there is a medical research policy that excludes research that's too medical and should be funded by the NH and MRC. Um, MRO can provide advice about that, but they can only provide as much advice as you give them time to do. So try and meet those deadlines as best you can. The best advice comes when they've got heaps of time to review your grants. <coughs> then there's the ARC deadline. Following the ARC deadline, there's a rejoinder period where the assessments come to you and you get to provide a response. And then announcements are in the fourth quarter um, of next year, nominally. Who knows what will actually happen? This year, or this coming year, they're going to make a change to the scheme in that it's not only going to happen once next year, they're going to shift the DECRA timelines to align them with the other fellowship schemes. So at the moment, DECRAs happen early in the year. Um, future fellowships and laureates happen towards sort of the second, third of the year, sort of October, November-ish. And so next year, they're also going to have a second round of DECRAs to bring DECRAs in line with the future and laureate fellowships in terms of their timeline and to separate them from the discovery projects and other components of the grants program. So the grant guidelines should be the same for the second round next year. They'll open in September um, and then they'll close in November and they should be announced in the middle of the year. 
So there's a couple of opportunities to apply next year. Um, I guess the interesting part of this is that those outcomes, so those applications will close on the 11th of November. If we go back to these ones, the announcements will be in the fourth quarter, only one, much, one month of which is before the 11th of November. Um, and so it's not clear exactly how these two rounds are going to break out in that you may not know the outcome of one round until very close to the deadline for the following round. Yeah. I have a question. So the next one will be then in March or will be shifted into the October 2021? So there will be... So there'll be... Yeah, so there should be one in March 2020. Uh, so next year, March 2020. And then there'll be one in November 2020. And then the one after that should be in November again. So they'll shift to an annual round in November-ish. So that, yeah, that's the same way that the futures and other things run. Cool. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's what... I'm not laughing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So one of the, yeah, one of the, um, the bits of advice is to try not to optimise in, in any way around that because you never quite know what will happen. At this point, I'd expect it to be March, November, November the following year, but we don't know. Yeah? Uh, uh, yes, so for the, the, the March, uh, uh, there will be two, round, uh, two rounds next year. Yeah. The second round should be, uh, the second round is exactly the same as the first round, I mean like a number of awards. It should be. Yes, as far as I understand, but don't actually yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid uh, maybe the second round we have of, of fewer awards. Yeah, so even though so universities work on calendar years, the funding for the ARC works on financial years. And so the next round in 2020 will be in a different financial year to the current round in the beginning of the year. And so I understand that should be how it works out. But again, it's about We'll talk about this a little bit later on, but it's about you know timing when the appropriate time to go is rather than trying to optimise what you think the success rates might be. And then there was another question down here. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I don't expect that there'll be a difference, but I don't know. Okay. So now we can start drilling down further and further into the details about these things. So this year, the selection criteria have changed, both in terms of weighting and the relative prominence. So investigator and capability is now half um, of the assessment. Project quality and innovation is 25%. Benefits is 15% and feasibility is 10%. So beginning with this coming round, it's more weighted towards the investigator than um, it has been in previous years. So that's not up very much, but it is up a little bit and it is probably gonna shift the way that people think about it. It has also shifted the way they ask you to structure the application. So thinking about that investigator component and the best way to put yourself forward, the best way to map your capability to the proposed project is going to be really important. So I can distribute these slides after so that no one needs to keep taking pictures. There's 70 something of them, but I'll send them around. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit more investigator driven than previously. Now, this is one of those things that people can get really worried about. Um, I would view it as the ARC are trying to respond. I imagine what happened last year is they had people who they thought were deserving of applications, but maybe they made a bit of a misstep in the project. And so they're trying to make sure those people get through. In a few years, they'll decide that good projects aren't getting through. And so they'll shift it back to the project and it just wanders around a little bit like that. But this year, we're a bit more focused on the investigator and the capability than we have been in previous years. So again, this is the text taken from the ARC. So the two things that they say are, for the investigator capability, you need to describe the research output and performance evidence. So your traditional and non-traditional research outputs, the way that you're recognized by your community and various things like that, including high quality research outputs appropriate to the discipline. And the only other thing they say about this section is the capability of the candidate to build collaborations both within Australia and internationally. So they've got you, how great are you, but they've also got what are you going to, what's this, to think about it from an investment point of view from the Australian government, what's this investment going to get the Australian government beyond just the direct impacts on you? So how is the money that they invest in you going to spread out more broadly? 
So if you're building collaboration networks within and outside of Australia, that's some other benefit the government get. So you want to sort of keep that in mind as you're designing your project and designing the sorts of things you're going to do and who you're going to propose to collaborate with. So 50% of the grant is on those two things. A quarter of the grant is the project. So contribution to an important gap in knowledge or a significant problem. So you're going to need to identify what that gap is, how you're going to solve it. Um, the novelty and innovation of the proposed research. New methods, techniques, theories, ideas that will be developed. Um, remembering that novelty and, origin and originality isn't necessarily there's a new machine out and it can do things better. Um, an old machine that does new things can also be valuable. You need to be clear. And this is something that both of the College of Experts members I have information from say. The clarity of hypotheses, theories and research questions is really important. Getting that message across about how good you are, how good your capabilities are and how good the project is, really important. Clarity is super important. It's got to be cohesive. You've got to have a plan to do it. So there's components of feasibility that come up elsewhere. But you need to be able to convince people that you're actually going to be able to carry this out. And Again, the extent to which the research has the potential to enhance, this time, international collaboration. So what's this doing for Australia on the international stage? And it's a good lens to view all of these things through, is when the minister signs these, what does he get? Um, think about what you're delivering for the investment that they're making. The benefits. So again, it can be fundamental research, it can be applied research. So it's newer advanced knowledge resulting from the outcomes of the research. Even though um, we have a government that's a bit more focused on sort of industry collaboration, benefit is just new and advanced knowledge. It's explicitly stated as part of the grant. So generating new knowledge is important. Training students is important. Economic, cultural, environmental, social and or cultural benefits for Australia and international communities. That becomes important in a couple of spots in the application. But it's basically, you know, why should Australia care? Why should they be paying several hundred thousand dollars for this research to take place? Um, and the potential contribution to capacity in the Australian government's national science and research priorities and other priorities identified for, by the government. So we'd be able to look up the national science and research priorities and see how you map to them um, and find out whatever other priorities that the government has stated anywhere that you can map your research to. It's not too clear how much mapping to these actually makes a difference in the outcomes. But if it's in there, um, it's a useful thing to have. And then there's the feasibil feasibility. So the top one there is cost effectiveness of the research and its value for money. Now the DECRA scheme provides a salary and it provides up to $50,000 worth of research costs. So everyone's going to be asking for about $50,000 worth of research costs, except perhaps um, theoreticians, mathematicians, maybe phys theoretical physicists perhaps. And so the value for money doesn't come in in the total amount that you're spending. It comes in in the government's or the minister's or the assessor's or the college's perception of how much bang for the buck they're getting. They're going to have to optimise. They're going to be over a thousand applications for 200 um, positions. They've got to work out where the best place to put that investment is. And so it's not cost effectiveness in terms of how much you're spending. It's cost effectiveness in what are you doing with the money that you are spending. Feasibility. You've got to convince the panel, the assessors, the, not so much the minister for this one, but you've got to convince those folk that the research can actually be done. Um, and we'll talk about this when we get to the selection panels, but one thing to bear in mind is there's a little bit of a trap here for those of us who are fortunate enough to be at Group of Eight universities, because things that are possible at Group of Eights are often not possible in other places. And the panel who make the decisions are not drawn from universities like Monash, they're drawn from the entire Australian higher education system. And so we might be able to achieve things that are big and ambitious here that DECRAs at other universities would be significantly constrained from being able to do. And so people who are from those other universities might think there's no way this can be done. So part of your job is to make sure that whatever it is you're proposing, you can convince the assessors that you can actually do it. And the availability of the necessary facilities is pretty much no brainer. Um, supportive environment for the DECRA candidate and their project and for HDR students where appropriate. So if there are HDR students associated with the grant, and there's some hints in the bits we've seen so far that research training is going to be important, they need to be in a good and supportive environment. And again, there's a little bit of a line to walk here in that the DECRA is designed for folk who are transitioning somewhere between sort of a PhD postdoc position and an independent position. So you've got to talk about why 
the mentoring facilities are great, not that you're working under the direct and close supervision of some superstar because the project is about you, not about the people that you're working with. They need to support and they need to support through you HDR students, um, but you've got to have that element of independence to it. And then if your project involves Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders um, or research on issues related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, you need to involve those folk. Um, you can't just try and get cheeky points for doing research important to Indigenous communities if you're not actually engaging with those communities at all. So, we'll talk about strategy for preparing an assessment later, but let's move on to now the point where you have a, um, a proposal and you've submitted it. It then goes through a series of steps. So your proposal, your application, first goes to the panel. So there'll be an assessment committee formed. That panel will choose assessors. So the, pa the proposal will then go out to external assessors, mostly from Australia. About a quarter of them will be international. Those assessors will each write in very small text boxes under each of those um, assessment criteria. They'll write a few hundred words, if you're lucky, um, and then they'll give you a score. Those words and scores, or the words, sorry, are provided to you. You're given the opportunity to write what's called a rejoinder. So a rejoinder is a response to the assessments. The proposal, the assessments, and the rejoinder all then go to the panel. The panel form their opinions, then they get together and have a big argument, decide who gets funded, and then the announcements are made. So you have a series of stages in this, and it's worth, and so the next bit is I'm gonna break down each of those stages because they tell you who your audience are. They tell you who you need to cater to, who are the community that you're trying to convince that this research is worth funding. So they're all assessed against the selection criteria they go to the panel, and then the panel send them out. Well, then they get assessed by a group of different people. So there are two general assessors. There's a lead assessor termed carriage one, a, lead, a second assessor termed carriage two. These people are taken from the College of es Experts, we'll talk about in a sec. And then they go to two detailed assessors. Those detailed assessors will be hopefully expert-ish in your research, you'll have some knowledge of it. And the ARC staff are involved in this process in terms of they just make sure that eligibility is um, checked and that grants are appropriately formatted and that they haven't breached the medical research policy and things like that. But the assessment is all done by academics, members of the panel and external assessors. So the key group of individuals in this process are the ARC College of Experts. So they play a key role in identifying research excellence they assign the detailed assessors, they make sure they get new assessors, they provide feedback, and they implement pre-review process. So the key here is that these are experts of international standing drawn from the Australian research community. These are not individuals that represent the people who get funded. They're not people who represent the people who do the best research in Australia necessarily. They are people who represent the full breadth of the Australian higher education system. So there's gonna be a diversity of experience and opportunity and CV strength and all sorts of stuff in there. But they represent the entire Australian research community. They don't represent your discipline. They don't represent universities like Monash. They don't represent the people who do the research. They represent the community. And that can be challenging because that audience have different, uh, have different understandings of what can be done. There could be people on here who've been unsuccessful with the ARC system for many, many years. There'll be some people who get them year in, year out. So they're the representative of the higher education research community in Australia, not the top researchers, necessarily. If they're listening, you're all wonderful. So the general assessors, they form what's called the Selection Advisory Committee. Um, so the Selection Advisory Committee is, for the DECRA scheme, it'll be drawn pretty much from the ARC College of Experts. You can go to the ARC website and you can see who the ARC College of Experts are. So that College of Experts, will be the people who are making the final decision on your projects. So go and look at them, see who they are, get a sense of how um, broad their expertise is. See how many are from actually from your research field. Even if there is the world leader in your research field who you've never collaborated with and who isn't at Monash, that individual might not be on the DECRA panel this year. That individual might be on the Future Fellowship panel or the Discovery panel or the Linkage panel. So even if you're lucky enough to have an expert, 
on this um, selection advisory committee, there's no guarantee they'll actually be th well, on the College of Experts. There's no guarantee they'll be on the committee that assesses your grants. All of this is to just basically make sure that you understand that these are likely to be non-experts. You'll be very lucky if you get someone who's from your discipline. I think in my career, there's been someone from my discipline for three of the 11 years I've been an academic in Australia. Usually it's people who are in adjacent or secondarily adjacent fields. So in the assessment phase, these detailed assessors, the members of the selection advisory committee drawn from the College of Experts, um, they assign the detailed assessors. They consider the application themselves. They consider the assessments provided by the detailed assessors and the rejoinder, and they assign their own scores. They then take these scores to a selection meeting, and if they are carriage one, that first carriage of the grant, they will get, if you're ranked highly enough, um, they will get a minute, maybe two minutes, to convince the panel that your grant should be funded. So this person, carriage one, from the College of Experts on the Selection Advisory Committee, is probably not an expert in your field, and probably has two minutes to convince a panel at best, that yours is one of the grants that should be funded. That's if you're in the ranking sort of zone. We'll get to some more details about that after. So that's, the per that's one of your target audiences. You've got to convince that person. You've got to give them the information that when they trot in, they've got their pile of maybe for the decorators it might be 20 or 40. For a discovery project, it could be 80. They've got this pile. They've got to remember who you are. They've got to remember the pitch about your grant, and they've got to be able to sell it to a big table of other people who are tired and also have 100 grants to remember. So that's someone to convince. And that's where we get to clarity. Clean, clear, simple messages. Important research. So that group of the Selection Advisory Committee will assign detailed assessors. They're drawn from the Australian and international research community. Again, from the Australian community, they're not necessarily people who get funded. Um, they're representative of the Australian Research Committee. They provide in-depth assessments. That's what the ARC says. In reality, they provide a few lines of assessment. Um, they provide scores and comments against the selection criteria. Those assessments are taken in consideration by the general assessors on the committee in the later stages of the process. Now we can start to think about how to strategize. So when you're putting your grant together, there are a few key bits of information that will dictate who gets to read it as much as you are able to dictate this. So assessors are assigned the bit of information that the um, Selection Advisory Committee get is it generates a word cloud using your application summary, your application title, your impact statement, um, and some codes that you provide for field of research and socioeconomic objectives. So that's a few hundred words that you often write last. I do every time, which I probably shouldn't as I talk about this now. Um, that's a few hundred words that dictate who's likely to read your grant in Australia and internationally and provide those detailed assessments and provide the scores that yield the initial ranking that is then adjusted by the Selection Advisory Committee. So these things that we often leave till last and we think about the big detailed project diving down into the details of the methods and getting all that right and then we think, oh, I'll just knock together an application summary. Um, that application summary is important in who gets to read it and then who makes judgments on all the other stuff. So that's a bit that you can um, manipulate. Oh, you can, but I have not, I have not seen one um, in terms of what actually it looks like um, when the assessors get it. So I don't, I don't know if they weight different sections differently. Um, this is the information they give us, that it's a word cloud based on that. I don't know how many words are going to appear across all of those things. There's only going to be a few if you take out the ands and the thus. Um, so there's, you know, if you want to get some key, so thinking about that, if you want to get some key fields involved, those are the words that you want to have in your title and your application summary. So for example, I'm a particular type of biologist, I'm a physiologist. Um, I work in evolution a little bit, but I'm not an evolutionary biologist. So I might try and keep evolutionary biology out of those sections so that it goes to my peeps as best I can rather than goes to the um, evolutionary folk who might not appreciate it. So this is where you can start to, to play with those. We'll keep talking about that. RMS generates some suggestions based on that word cloud and then the College of Experts will get a list um, of people that they can select. 
Okay, and then once they get that list of people to select, they're going to try and make sure disciplines are represented. They're going to try and make sure that gender representation is appropriate. So they will optimize that list. There is a human who's involved in that, the um, selection advisory committee member. So it's not automatically assigned to assessors, but that word clouds generates the list from whom they choose, unless they want to throw others in. You can't be assessed by anyone who's submitted to the same round. So people who are also in the DECRA round can't um, assess other DECRAs. And then RMS also puts together the discipline panel. So the College of Experts covers all of the research areas of the ARC. Discipline panels are formed to make the assessments. So in biology, it's biology and biotechnology, basically. And the people who get put onto that are generated by the word clouds of the applicants who submitted into that round as well. So this is also how you can try and make sure that you get the right selection advisory committee members from the college in there. So the first part of optimization is trying to control your audience as best you can. At the end of that assignment, the assessors will provide a score. And then if we run down this list of scores, it goes through outstanding, excellent, very good, good. And by the time you get down to good, that's 80% of applications, but only the top quarter of those are likely to be funded. And so this system is set up with an explicit understanding that there's a lot more good research going on than can possibly be funded. So you've got to write out that top end. Outstanding, ideally. Um, excellent, hopefully. And then you know, very good is getting towards the boundary. So this round, this scheme is tough. Um, there's never enough funding to go around. There's always too many good people that can possibly be funded. So you get a scoring matrix, or the assessors will provide those scores. Remember, you'll never see the scores that the assessors provide. Um, what you will see is the comments they provide. They might use words like outstanding, excellent, and very good to try and match up their scores to their comments, or they might not. You never really know how the scores actually map to the comments. So trying to read those tea leaves is the path to madness. Um, all, you can do with, all you can really deal with is what you submit, what you rejoined, and then the rest is out of your hand and trying to make predictions. I've given up even doing this job. Um, it's really, really hard to make predictions. So that scoring matrix is produced, comments are provided, and then you get to write a rejoinder. So the ARC gets those detailed assessments. Applicants get the opportunity to write a rejoinder. It's very short. Um, you don't get much, I think you get a thousand words or something like that. Now, when you come to write your rejoinder, rejoinders are never seen by the detailed assessors. So the people who wrote the assessment will never see what you say about their assessment. That's an opportunity. You don't need to worry about their feelings. You don't need to worry about them seeking revenge. They have no opportunity to do so. The only people who see your rejoinder are the selection advisory committee. So your re rejoinder, it has to be short. It should be direct, should be explicit. Um, it should address the concerns that are raised. Those um, the College of Experts members do tell us that those rejoinders make a difference. They can shift people up and down. Um, they can change an opinion about a grant. If something was a little bit unclear, an assessor's had a problem with it, a great response has been sent, that problem is dealt with, you don't worry about it anymore. The ARC very rarely um, intervenes in the peer review process. So you'd have to get an assessment that was wildly out of bounds before the ARC would um, the ARC as an organisation itself would put that assessment in the bin. What will happen is the College of Experts will ignore some of them. So they get sort of a dashboard that'll show them the assessments and they'll know if one stands out. They'll be get, I mean, they'll be reading dozens or up to a hundred of these things. They'll get really good at picking where an assessor has said inappropriate things and they'll just disregard it. So getting the ARC to deal, to deal with those um, very, very rarely happens you're really down to the College of Experts and having trust in them that with the combination of what the assessors provided and what you've used in your rejoinder will deal with that assessment. So that's really your own, that rejoinder is really your opportunity to deal with a prickly reviewer. And so you those assessments, rejoinder, then it goes back to the selection advisory committee. The selection advisory committee will consider all of that um, but you need to bear in mind the depth with which they have capacity to assess it. So Moira O'Brien, a couple of years ago, said that she got something like 80 discovery projects, 20 DECRAs, and some other things. So she was reading a stack of 100 grants 
um, that are 50, 80 pages each. So that tells you how much time they've got to go through each of them. So they're going to pick on some key bits of information. We'll talk about how to make sure you get that right a bit later on. They'll confer with each other, the general assessors on the selection advisory committee to finalise their scores and develop a ranking. Um, they sort of deal with the breadth of different sort of ranking styles to make sure that people who tend to rank more lowly than others are all normalised to each other. They get ranked within a discipline panel and then that discipline panel wide ranking is the beginning of what they use to make a decision. So between the rejoinder and the selection advisory committee's meeting, they form this preliminary ranking of the grants. And that preliminary ranking will dictate which grants are discussed, which grants are going to get pushed up, which grants are going to get pushed down. So even though we talk a lot about how important the selection advisory committee are and how important the College of Experts are, you've got to get into that range where you're actually considered in order to have their important consideration. So that rejoinder again, that just shows the importance of that, making sure you're in the discussion. Before the selection meeting, the panels get to go through all of the rankings. They get to see the full complete ranking. They're encouraged to note where they see some that have ended up in a place where they shouldn't. Say they had a really great application that's ended up low. They can flag that one for discussion to send it back up if they can. They're invited to closely scrutinise ROPE issues. So this is the research outputs and performance um, evidence, research yeah, opportunity and performance evidence. Um, this is where they can also make sure that people are treated fairly with regard to their opportunity. And so you need to make sure that the panel members can see relative to opportunity quite well. If they can't see it, they can't address it. And we are told by the members of the panel that there are always people around that panel who fiercely advocate to make sure that um, career opportunity is appropriately dealt with and they won't let stuff slide if it's not. So that panel is really serious about that, but you've got to give them the tools to be able to assess it properly. And they're particularly drawn to applications around the likely um, funding cutoff. So those that are right, right up the top, they're probably going to get funded. Right, right down the bottom, they're probably not going to get funded. As you get around that cusp area, those are the ones that need to be discussed to make sure the right ones end up above um, as best as they can manage it. So the panel members will make their recommendations. Um, the ranking, the final ranking will be provided to the ARC and then the ARC provide a recommendation to the Minister for the grants that should be funded. It has always been the case, even though it feels a bit more like it's sort of politically charged at the moment, but it has always been the case and it's written to the Australian Research Council Act that it's the Minister who actually makes the funding decisions. The ARC does not. The ARC makes funding recommendations, the Minister makes the decision. Part of, the re part of the information on which the Minister makes the decision is the National Interest Test. Um, the National Interest Test has been worried about quite a bit. It's actually not such a big deal. It's really just a little bit about, you know, why should Australia care? Why should the taxpayers fund this sort of stuff? Um, if your grant is about improving China's capacity to hack other uh, government organisations, it's probably not in the national interest. It's designed to catch that sort of stuff. Um, but it can also be misused to exclude grants the minister would be embarrassed having to justify. It doesn't tend to affect STEM disciplines, it affects humanities, arts and social sciences much more than us. Um, but that national interest test is in there, you've got to be able to explain why Australia should care. And that's actually true for all of the research that we do. Like, I'm paid by the university, I'm paid by students, I need to be able to explain to them why my research should exist. I should be able to explain to taxpayers why they should be paying for it. So this is something that we do need to do and it's part of the national interest test is how we do it. So applications that satisfy the national interest test and score highly will be recommended to the Minister for Funding. The Minister will decide which ones get funded and then that information will be made public eventually one day. So the next thing we'll talk about is um, the outcomes of these schemes. So in black we have male applicants, in orange we have female applicants. So the success rate hovers somewhere below 20. Um, there tends to be fewer women who apply. The success rate for women tends to be a little bit higher, um, but it's pretty constant across time. So from DE13 -E through to DE20, the most recent round, they funded 200 applications each year, and the bumps in funding success are mostly dictated by changes in the number of applicants. In the first round, DE12, they funded more than 200 applications, but there were many, many more applications than there were in any subsequent year. So it hovers around that level. We can probably expect 15, 16 
something like that percent um, in the coming round, although what I guess we don't know is whether people will wait until the round after to apply, or maybe everyone will apply in the next round, or maybe the round after. It's just, you're never gonna know. It's about picking the time that's right for you, not trying to worry about what you think other people might be doing. Monash science typically does really well. Um, so this year, just gone in the DE20 round was the first year we dipped below national success um, overall. And there's no difference between internal and external applicant success rates for people who apply through the Monash Faculty of Science. So people often wonder about, you know, should you be moving? Do you need to go to other universities? What you need to do is go to the university that's most appropriate for your research. If that research is Monash and you have, if that university is Monash and you happen to already be here, your success rate is likely to be unchanged. At least that's what the information we have from the last four, <coughs> six rounds. The last six rounds is basically no difference. One of the things, the bits of advice people will get is that there are more applications awarded to people later in their career, towards that end of that five year eligibility window. Now that's true, but it's only true because more people apply later in that eligibility window. The success rates from straight out of PhD through to people who've um, taken up that full five years are pretty flat. Maybe they rise a little bit as you get, but we're talking about a tiny few percent. Um, so there's no optimization here in terms of what year should you apply. There are lots of different reasons people might need to apply in particular years. Those are the ways that you make the decision. You don't make the decision in that I'll wait until year five because that's the one where I'm most likely to be successful. I mean, even if that's the case, your success might go from 15 to 16%. Um, that's basically not worth worrying about. So it's about picking the year, that's picking the time that's most appropriate for your career, your life, your objectives, all of those sorts of things. So my first strategic message, I guess, is when you're thinking about applying, don't try and game um, the system to the extent that you're trying to pick the optimal time. No one knows what the optimal time is. And also you're always at risk. So the only constant with the ARC is change. We know that there are two rounds coming which is more certainty than we usually get. If you try and optimize maybe three years from now, there's no guarantee the DECRA system will exist in its current form three years from now. When we shifted to the DECRA system from the previous scheme, which was the Australian postdoctoral scheme, there were a bunch of folk who tried to optimize their APD year, and then they missed out on a year of eligibility because the rules changed from APD to DECRA. And so anytime you try and optimize too far in the future, you're at the risk of that taking place. So it's really about applying when the time is appropriate for you, for your personal circumstances, your research career, um, and what you want to achieve in your life. And when you do come to apply, you've got to be thinking everything needs to be put forward in these few set, in a small number of questions. It's a fellowship scheme, 50% on investigator and capability, so why you? Why are you the person to be doing the research that you're proposing? Why Monash? Why should you do it here rather than RMIT or Oxford or University of Melbourne, or UQ, UWA. Why is Monash the place to do this research? Why is now the time to do it? So is the problem sort of cresting at the moment? Have you done something in your PhD or your first postdoc that really make this an opportune time to address this question? Has some new technology been invented that makes it possible to get more resolution on the problem than previously? So why me, why Monash, well, why, why, why me, why here, why now? And then the other bit you've always got to have this is why should Australia care? At some point, the minister is going to have to stand up and say, these are the grants that um, my government has chosen to fund and they need to be able to justify that because the decision rests on them. They're the gatekeeper of the Australian purse. They're spending that money. They need to justify to the taxpayers, to their constituents and to their party why these grants should be funded. So you've got to be able to tell them why Australia should care about this research. What does Australia get for this few hundred thousand dollars they're investing in your research? And to answer that, you get not that much <laughs> space. So the components of a DECRA, a DECRA application is broken up into a series of components. You've got an administrative summary. Most people leave this to last, but it's got that application summary in it. It's got national interest text in it. So these are the bits that the minister might read when the minister decides if they're going to follow the ARC's recommendation. You've got classifications and other statistical information. That's got your science and research priorities. So it's where you can align to the government's objectives. It's got the FOR and SEO codes, which are part of the way that these are assigned to assessors and to selection advisory committees. It's got questions about whether it's interdisciplinary and whether it's international. 
Remember, they care about those links with inter international researchers forming collaborations. So that's where you can tell them whether or not that's happening. They've then got eligibility questions. So part of it's what your current funding might be, what other applications you've got under consideration, but there's also a statement about medical research. So there's an ARC medical research policy which dictates whether a particular project falls within the scope of the Australian Research Council funding schemes. If the Australian Research Council judges an application to be fall foul of that medical research policy, it will be excluded. And that happened to one application from the Faculty of Science last year. MRO provided some advice that this was probably a bit close to the medical research and that it should be, you know, be careful. Um, the application went forward, the ARC ruled it ineligible, it was not considered for funding. So that medical research policy is really important. Yeah? Is there an obvious place to find the information on exactly what this cutoff is between medical research and non-medical research? So there's, there's a couple of ways. So there is the, the stated medical research policy, which in typical government speak is a little bit too vague. Um, the MRO have a pretty good read on what it is. Um, they maybe have a better read than researchers, so I'd put a little bit of faith in the MRO on this. Um, you can always ask me. Um, I can try and provide some advice. But it's really trying to stay away from that you know, clinical application, human health end of things. It could be fundamental research that might one day have benefits, but if it's building a widget or a do-bob that's going to improve human health, that's probably NHMRC. Um, if it's getting towards clinical trials, probably NHMRC. Um, but fundamental research that might lead to improvements in human health one day, that's where you start to walk that. Does the preclinical research fall in this um, as medical research or is Probably as medical research, um, or you'd have to be very careful about how you phrase it. So the MRO will be quite conservative in their application of the medical research policy. So basically they never want to be in the position of saying, this is fine, and then it gets it excluded. So they'll go a little bit beyond probably what the policy is. So if the MRO don't worry about it too much, it's probably going to be okay. But seeking advice as widely as you can. Um, you then get a project description, or well, Part D has a project description and the administering organ organisation statement. That covers off those different headings under which the selection criteria are made. Remembering that it also has that investigator capability section, but then there's a whole Part F which is dictated, uh, which is designated for participant details as well. So your track record and capability appear under Part D and under Part F. Um, you've got a project cost, and that's the application form. So that, in almost precisely an hour, is the putting together of a grant. Those are the bits that go into it and the things that you need to consider as you go and do it. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions now, you're more than welcome to. We've got a, we're going to have a little half hour break where I'm going to rest and relax, talk to anyone who's got questions about that first bit, and then we'll start diving into sort of more strategic details um, after some food. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the project description is mainly about the theory, the practicality and then the hypothesis. It's something like maybe like uh, preliminary results, something the materials that we can use in the application. So Yep. So preliminary results and things will speak to feasibility. If you can demonstrate that you can do it, but not that you've done it, um, then you can demonstrate that an application is feasible. The project description is also investigator and capability. So it's not just the project, it's also you. And we'll talk about putting those together and the rules around the various sections and the order of the sections and all that is still to come. If yeah. your research has nothing to do with medical stuff, do you need to have that medical statement? So it's a, the medical is, it's basically a drop box, yes or no. Um, and if it might be considered medical research, then you have to write a justification for why it doesn't breach the medical research policy. If it's far away from that, then it's fine. Um, do you have any advice on how to know when you might be ready to yeah. submit an application like this? Like when to know when you're competitive for doing it? Is it mostly from looking at the successful applications? Yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about how to maximise your competitiveness and the things that you can think about in the next session. Um, but it's a really hard... So you get two swings and you get five years in which to take those two swings. It's really hard to optimise that. Um, and it's quite case by case because it's going to depend on a combination of where your CV's at, but also the opportunity for the research at this point. So why now can come into play. Um, but it's, it'll probably be a little bit more in the direction of investigator strength this year than previous years. But if you look at the successful, the people who have been successful year on year, there is a surprisingly diverse array of CVs in there. It's not just 
you, know, you get three science papers and then you get a DECRA. Um, there's a diversity. And part of that comes down to you know, them explaining why they're the perfect person for this um, project at this time and why their CV as it is, whatever it is, makes them appropriate. But it's basically, yeah, there's no obvious way to pick. It's kind of going to be case by case. Yep. Uh, yes, so actually normally how, how long or how many pages the project is It's 10, 10 pages. including references. Uh, and if that's the case, normally how much time uh, the assessor was spent on the proposal? It's going to depend on the assessor. Um, so it's a little bit different this year compared to, so it's a bit harder to make predictions this year than in previous years, because in previous years we would advise people to set up the first page of the project description as an overview. This year the rules have changed that make that, to make that much harder. Um, so we don't quite know how people are gonna read these in ways that they have previously. But for me, um, I can probably read a discovery project in half an hour. Yeah, so 10 pages. Yeah. Okay, so we really should make our point very, very... Easy. Absolutely. And then, so assume the, the College of Experts member might get a few weeks, but they'll get a few weeks with a stack of 100 grants, each of them a 10-page section within 100 pages of other stuff. So they've got like 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 pages of stuff to go through. Um, they're going to go through that really fast. So the clarity of that message is really important. Um, I guess you might talk about this a bit more after the break, but how important is publication record in the context of growth and applicant strength? So there's a couple of different ways the public, oh, we'll talk about it. Um, there's a couple of different ways the publication record is considered. So it's considered in that you know, opportunities and performance evidence, um, but it's also considered with respect to discipline expectations. So it's not just the assessors look at what the publications are and make decisions about whether they're great or not. Um, you get an opportunity to tell the assessors what makes an outstanding CV in your discipline. So you kind of manipulate that process a bit um, to push that perception of outstanding towards your own CV. And there's a few different tricks that we can talk about for how you can paint your CV in the best possible light, um, which is part of the challenge. So it's going to be important, it's 50%. Track, rec track record-ish is 50%. There's no getting away that that CV is going to be important. It's really about, particularly between here and March, it's really about making the best case that you can with whatever CV you've currently got, because you can't change that between now and March. If you can, great. Um, but if you can't, it's about optimising that as best you can. Does everything on the CV have to be published? Or ah. So, I can't remember if there's a rule about where you could put um, things like preprints. There might, you could probably, you probably want to put them under, there's an other outputs section, so you can put them there. Um, there are opportunities to talk about uh, patents and things like that. Um, there are, you know, reports. If part of your research is very applied and you're making reports to government and that's led to policy change, you want to make sure that information is conveyed. Um, so publications are a big part of it and it's, I guess it's most cleanly set up to capture publications, um, but there are opportunities to present all the other non-traditional research outputs. Um, that people can produce as well. Yep. On, on the basis of the road, the, the, how, how important is, we, we talk about publication, how important is like award and then professional membership? Yep. So all that's um, in there as well, where you get a chance to talk about yourself. So the first section of the project description um, is investigator and capability, so you talk about it there. And then in the rope section, there's another chance to talk about yourself under awards and all sorts of things like that. So any way that you can use to, to demonstrate your standing in nationally and ideally internationally, um, that's where you put that kind of stuff. So all of that comes through as well. Yep. Okay, yeah, I just had a question about um, career interruption. Yep. So um, what I was curious about, like from what I understand, the um, application form that you hand in for the career interruption extends the eligibility. Correct. Um, but does it also have any bearing on the actual application, like the publication um, output and things like that? Because like, if you do have like, yep. a few kids, for example, yeah, yeah. and that influences you know, yeah. your, career, so, like, your research output, does that have any... There's kind of like there's two bits to it. So the eligibility exemption extends your eligibility, and then your relative to opportunity component of the application deals with the other stuff. So that deals with um, how many FTE 
you've had since PhD accounting for those career interruptions. The way that they ask you to present it, I think, is a bit shit. Um, and I'll suggest, I think it's a bit rubbish. Um, <laughs> I don't think it puts it as front and center as it should be. Um, and so making sure that comes across is part of another section. But yeah, there are there is definite opportunity to do that. Sure. And there's more than, you know, but I'm just wondering what would constitute a career interruption? Like, is it just like, you know, having children or disease, like getting ill? Yeah, so they've got, so they've got a list. Um, and so there's carers responsibilities in there. There's maternity leave. I can't remember whether they have paternity explicitly. Um, there is uh, illness, um, misadventure, that sort of stuff. There are non-research employment. Um, so they cover a bunch of stuff. No worries. Yeah. Sort of related to that, does the relative to opportunity um, sort of account for um, like when you've done your PhD? Because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, people who may have sort of done some some research and activities that contribute to their track record before actually doing the PhD, because yep. the clock sort of starts ticking from when that PhD is done. Does yep. it account for that? No, so the only clock it really makes you talk about is the time since PhD minus career interruptions. So if you started publishing well before you completed your PhD, there's a bonuses, kind of. Throw them on. Yeah, it's the, the one that it asks you to, to consider, well, the one that it considers most clearly is time since PhD minus career interruptions as a total number of FTE. Uh, yeah, so, so is the first success rate, is this success rate like almost uniform among group A university, universities? Uh, so we, that information I think is shared among the group of eight, but we don't always see it. So we, we only clearly know who gets them, we don't know who applies. So we know at Monash who applies, so we can work out Monash success rates. We know national success rates because they tell us. Um, but we don't know uni by uni unless the unis have shared them with each other. So we don't know if Melbourne have more success than us. Someone at Melbourne might know, someone at Monash might know, but they're probably unlikely to tell everyone because of the sort of more sensitive nature of unsuccessful applications. I heard a, a rumor, I, I, I just came back yeah. from a young academic forums conference and they said in 2000 and so next year, so in 2021, they're going to enforce an allocation of 50% male, 50% female for the crowd. Is yep. that true? I have no idea. It strikes me as unlikely. Um, they work really hard to make sure the success rates are similar. Um, I don't... I mean, the application numbers between male and female applicants are not that dissimilar in DECRA. As we see through most schemes, the number of proportion of female applicants declines as career stage increases. At DECRA level, it's not too different, so they potentially could. But I haven't heard that. There is a discussion about um, those kind of issues taking place currently, which could be where those rumours are coming from, and that people have maybe suggested it, I don't know. But I haven't been told. 